One of the things that came up with Dr. Mercola's talk was the silver bullets type of thing. The concepts that if you just use methylene blue, your long COVID patients will be all cured. I think that those types of things bother me. And that's why in the afternoon, I'm gonna take time when we do case reports. Uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna collect pivotal slides from each of the talks, at least I will try to do that, and use that for that hour and say, this is what we learned from this, and then get the expert panel to talk about it, because there are no silver bullets, and, and methylene blue will not cure your COVID, long COVID on its own, uh, and neither will walking on the beach on the sun cure it. So we have to balance and ultimately come up with a, a rational protocol that we would use on ourselves, and then a rational protocol that we could prescribe to, to a patients depending on what their uh, goals are, okay, and, and depending on how often we see them. But this is the, the nature of my particular talk today. You've heard a lot, of the, a lot of these concepts before. I will emphasize certain other ones. Um, you've seen this before many times. This is Dr. Milgram's slide. I, I, for those of us that can see, you'll notice everything on the right side Basically, you could have with a standard flu, except certain things are, are just a little bit weird, like facial paralysis, tunnel vision, total loss of vision. That doesn't happen with the flu, right? So, the, so the, it has visual disturbances that, that are odd. It has neurological disturbances that are very strange. Even early on, it has ARDS, of course, as the, as the primary cause of early death. It has hormonal effects, sexual dysfunction effects, uh, effects on fertility, and other parameters that, a lot of cardiac symptoms. So it, it is clearly its own animal, and we haven't seen this type of a, uh, of a situation before with a, with a clear virus. We've seen it with Lyme, we've seen it with the Lyme plus mold um, situations, but and that's why we have Dr. Nathan speaking to the toxins and so on. There's a lot of overlap, but I don't think we've ever seen an animal like this before. The GI component, which again, we don't have pointers here, but on the, on the top right, uh, we've seen with obviously enteroviruses in the past, but, um, but the destruction of the um, of the biome, even in patients who are not hospitalized and not given antibiotics and just get over the flu, get over COVID, SARS-CoV-2, and then go home and then get sick later is substantial. So I think we, we, we've learned all that in the last few days that when you have a long COVID patient, you have to take care of the GI system too. So uh, as the, uh, probably the only pathologist here, I'll say a few words on what happens when you see someone uh, at an autopsy um, that dies of acute COVID, whether it's 12 days later or 30 days later or 50 days later, from primarily from, car from pulmonary failure as the primary insult, then leading to total system collapse, which is renal failure and cardiac failure. So the the, the, best, the best representations of this are on the top right and then the bottom two left. The bottom two left show the majority of cases show large pulmonary emboli. Uh, uh, this takes out the main pulmonary artery and then one of the sides of the, maybe the right or left pulmonary artery, uh, and subsequent ischemia. The, the, the reason when you have a patient with an uh, average patient with small pulmonary emboli, you don't get pulmonary infarctions is because you have two circulations here. You have the pulmonary venous circulation and the pulmonary artery circulation, and you don't get infarctions. But here, when the heart is under pressure, as, as your systems fail, fail, you'll also get hemorrhage. And on the top right is a slice of, of, of the lung. It weighs three, four times normal. Uh, in the liters, and you have two, three liters of fluid in that lung. And that's, that's what uh, stops the, the oxygen transport in addition to the inefficiency. 
So basically when you cut it, it froths, it's, it's not flat, the, the average lung just collapses, this lung froths up and uh, talks to you almost because you're releasing an immense amount of pressure. There's no way to get this fluid out. So I didn't show the microthrombi in that, in that particular thing, so I want to show it now. Um, when you have a, an autopsy of a patient that has 30, 40 day history or 20 day history and they, but it's doing poorly, is intubated and just not right, uh, it, the, the cytokine storm has gone unabated, you see this and you see microthrombi in, in all the organs. The, the organ on the left happens to be a, a large vein in the, end, in the epicardial component of the heart, the outer surface of the heart. This is not an artery, it's a vein. Uh, there's a small microthrombus in the vein on, on the heart in the middle section off to the two o'clock. Uh, there's uh, two microthrombi and I don't see the organ there on, on, the, on, the, upper la on the upper right. Um, a large venous clot in a solid organ, I think it's probably the spleen, and then the lung uh, and then uh, another organ, I can't, I can't tell which one it is. It's to me looks like an ovary or a uterus. But in fact, clinically, this is what you see. So you have total system failure. And despite the fact that I told you yesterday that you don't see myocarditis in the early phases of the disease and you don't see typically encephalitis, although you can rarely, uh, in the first phase, meaning the acute phase, if the patients don't do well, you still find vascular pathology in every organ. So here's the uh, metabolic consequences with uh, steatosis or, or fatty accumulation in the liver with LFTs going, zooming up, the GGTTP going up first, and then uh, SGOT and PT going up and Alphonse going up. This is basically the the equivalent of a moderate degree of hepatic failure. It's not as bad as fulminant myocarditis. I mean, it's fulminant hepatitis, but it's pretty bad, and your detox systems will not function in this environment. And interesting in the kidney, the kidney on the left looks like uh, uh, focal sclerosis, like an autoimmune state, but that is all microthrombi in the glomerular systems. So the kidney fails both because of septic shock, so to speak, the, the sepsis being viral in this case. It's the same inflammatory cascade, though, without the use so much of neutrophils. It uses mainly lymphocytes to, to, to gear it. Um, there, the middle is, again, microthrombi in some of those empty spaces, which are uh, kidney uh, tubules. And again, um, it's hard to say, but, uh, but the, mainly these are all kidney, kidney slides. The, the one in the center on the, on the lower side is, uh, again, a glomerulus with multiple microthrombi. So this looks very much like TTP, thrombocytopenic thrombotic purpura. It, it looks like septic shock, the end of septic shock, except it's not the classical cascade of septic shock. It's not a bacterial-induced septic shock. It's a virally-induced septic shock. So the, who can do that? It, it could be done by hemorrhagic fever. It could be done by the ones that interact both with the immune system dysfunction, but then go into the thrombotic cascade. You have to have both of them to get this type of a picture. The slide on the, uh, on the far is an immunohistochemistry sl slide I think looking at the, the deposition of fibrin. So here you have a lot of hemorrhage too, and, and, and why? It, this is, happens to be in the, in the lung, but it's all over. Every organ has hemorrhage in those patients, and why is because you have the microthrombi in both the arterioles as well as the, the arteries, instead, and not just the veins. And you superimpose on all of this when you have in the intensive care unit, but also to a lesser extent when we're taking care of long COVID patients. Some of them have bruising when they hit, you know, just excessive bruising because you have also a hypoxic component to deal with, not just uh, the, the pathology that you're looking at. So again, this is hyaline membrane disease. 
It's a classical, a classical picture of, uh, of microthrombi and hemorrhage and um, growth of the interstitium between the two alveolar spaces with hyaline membranes and loss of the epithelium. So this is classical, and this responds early on to steroids. It responds early on to ozone. It responds early on to vitamin C, which is a directly um, antiviral, so to speak, doses of vitamin C, um, and may respond well to methylene blue intravenously, but you can't get that in the hospital, right? You can't get any of those things in the hospital, uh, except for the rare cases in Italy and in, and in China that, that publish the data on this. But you see this. Uh, so it's the hemorrhage, 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 and it's the slow destruction of the normal parenchyma. So this is what you look at when you have the autopsy, but the it's the exact same thing if someone survives. Because the reason you survive with this is because your kidneys don't shut down and, and your hepatic function is relatively normal, so you tend to be younger or healthier to start with. You still end up with this. You send th this is what you end up with. Um, and and, and we, we have some cases that we showed in the first day in the EBU session. I'll show it again sometime in the afternoon. And this is still all reversible because macrophages will take out the hemorrhage. And you see, you notice the, 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 the emphysema on the, on the left side. This person brought that emphysema to the table. This didn't happen because of the disease. So you can have restore normal architecture if you grab this type of patient earlier on. So they don't have to have permanent pulmonary fibrosis uh, if we act, if we help them act a little bit more um, diligently and quickly. So this is uh, the slide from the first day that we had in the EBU. It's, you have to look at it as a complex chronic illness. In this case, it's a, a little bit more than a bacterial sepsis because it, 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 um, it, has, it affects everything, not just the local tissue, right from the very, very beginning. It first affects the lung more, so that's the one we focus on more, but you have to look at it from this perspective, on the long side, certainly. So what happened? So we had the government say, wait till you can't breathe anymore, and then call us up, and then we'll invite you to the, to the emergency room. Or you form your own society of, of intensive care people, typically pulmonologists, but also anesthesiologists and a few cardiologists, uh, thankfully, who, who work with intensive care unit patients and hospitalists, and you say this doesn't make any sense. So you have to form your own nonprofit organization, which actually takes nine months to do. I mean, in order to get your 501c3 status in the United States, it takes a minimum of 9 to 12 months. So they started this before they had the nonprofit status. They couldn't accept any donations. Now we can donate to them. You know, the public can donate. But initially, I mean, they don't take salaries anyway. But, but they have to have a staff now handling a meeting that they just had uh, two weeks ago that had 2,000 people attending. So that's when they heard for the first time about melatonin, they heard for the first time Ibu, they heard the first time ozone, they never heard of these things before. They had heard already about LDN. So they're becoming more integrative and now we're gonna have a new class of integrative intensive care unit people in the United States that know about vitamin C. It's a whole different story about ozone, that's gonna be difficult, but, but, but certainly possible. So now they have this, I prevent, I care, the, Hospital treatment protocol has been in place since, since the summer of 2020. I recover, long treatment, long, and that's where they want our input the most, the recovery input, because they have limited capability of thinking about something that has this, this many symptoms. But that's the response that we have. Instead of the public health society doing this, we, have, we as a team, in this case, they, it's not us, had to organize in order to, from two people, three people, 10 people, and now 2,000 people show up. So what did they do that was different? What do we do that's different than the colleagues that we have and in, uh, in, in the usual colleagues that we have? We exercised 
thinking. We read the data. We did read the data, and the data became clear as early as the spring of 2020. And we analyzed it, and we draw rational conclusions from it. And we now know for certain, we, we got signals from the earliest part of the pandemic that vaccinations were never tested to stop transmission. This was the biggest lie that affected every one of us and our families. And um, the, it was never targeted towards the, the risks the risk groups, even if it was effective, it was never targeted properly. I remember in San Francisco, the city shutting down, all, all, the, all, all the tech workers were thrilled to stay home. <laughs> they were thrilled because they could work like that. And we had to suppress the feeling that all the workers that had to go to work were poor and had no say in the matter. So they, they, the meat packers went on. There was a special presidential level thing. You have to continue feeding us meat. And no matter what, it doesn't matter what, it, well, what the deal is going to be, you're going to put yourself at risk. And in, in our society, that's the, the, the poorest of the poor who have no, nothing to, you know, they, have, they have no choice. So that was the thing. So there's a, an interesting paper by a, a gal named Iwasaki. She's a, a, a PhD. Um, that started unteasing the, this is a while ago already, unteasing the transition between the acute stuff that you can read about, which frankly no longer exists, and then now transitioning into what we're seeing now. So there's a persistent viral load. Uh, our, the mechanisms uh, we don't know about, but we, we do know that, that whether it's shedding or not, uh, this is identical both for the virus and for the vaccine. Viral load drives the early inflammatory lesion, the higher you go. So the later you are, which is, was forced by the, by the community, you were thrown out of the emergency room unless you had a PO2 under a certain level. It didn't matter how sick you were. You were asked to go back home. You would not get admitted. So you had to go back home. So everyone was forced to be treated late when viral load dr drove the early part, and now it's the persistence of that virus <clears throat> or vaccine that is now dictating a subset of people with severe disease, and then a much larger majority of people with subtle disease, sometimes as subtle as, subtle as a cough. When you can hear it, most often it isn't. It could, be, it could be the resurgence of PCOS. It could be a resurgence of autoimmunity. It, it could be myocarditis. Uh, it could be, brain, more likely than not, it would be brain fog. So you have a set of uh, different forms of interferon that are pro-inflammatory, certain ones that are anti-inflammatory. I don't want you to be confused by this. You'll see one, one lecture versus another. Nobody understands wh what's purely pro-inflammatory, what's purely anti-inflammatory, because they, they, they converge. It's like the same wheel is, is necessary for life, is also necessary for repair, is also necessary for pro-inflammatory states. It's just, it, it, we don't know enough to, to say. And then there, I'll, I'll talk about the four signature plasma proteins again, but diabetics tend to do worse. <clears throat> Men tend to do worse because of the you know, our lack of estrogen. Uh, and postmenopausal women do probably the best who are on bioidentical hormones. Uh, but there are certain types of things, um, certain types of patterns that are beginning to emerge. But these patterns are not commercially available. You can do this, the cytokine panel on uh, Cyrex. Uh, I'm going to start using the lymphocyte map. Uh, <clears throat> but it, it, it doesn't have cytokine panels with them. So then you have to combine the two, and the best cytokine panel, I, I think, is from LabCorp. And it's, it's difficult to say anything except, oh, this is up and that's down. So you can track something over time, but really you're tracking how do you feel? What is your PO2? You know, what's your energy status? I think the, the symptoms uh, trump everything. Only the people in the front can see what this says. Um, 
do you want to focus on long-term protection versus the upper part, which is severe disease? It looks the same, frankly. There's a lot more dots on the top. There are more cells involved on the top. So you have on the, on the top, you have mast cells. You have these NET, these neutrophil cells that are, uh, are now activated. Um, you have platelets that are activated. Um, and, and you have um, uh, fewer early T cells, more B cells, frankly. The B cells uh, are already dysfunctional, so they're producing more autoantibodies in the majority of these folks that are going to be leading to severe disease either early or later. And you have a, a, a larger cluster of these ILs in the, in the right upper corner. You also have some platelets that are activated and they're quite angry and you'll eventually leak and you'll eventually thrombose. Versus the easier way to think about it is, okay, I have a, pro I have a properly functioning macrophage. It's gonna target, uh, whether it's an NK cell or a dendritic cell, it's gonna target that infected cell and it's going to wipe the, it's just gonna wipe the virus out and everything is gonna be okay. But what we know from that, even from what we know from that, if you don't make your T cells early uh, and you just make a bunch of B cells, you're gonna do, you're gonna do more poorly in the long term. A and you're probably not gonna have lifelong protection. So I think if you focus on, on, the, on the right side, I think that's a kidney on the left side. Uh, if you focus on the right side, you have this <clears throat> angiogen presenting cell, which is a macrophage. In this case, it could be an NK cell or a dendritic cell. Their job is, the NK cell's job is to kill vis-a-vis, -vis, either on its own or vis-a-vis -a, -vis a cytotoxic T cell. The dendritic cell is supposed to, what's, what's here, is supposed to train. So with the expression of MHC on its, on its surface, <clears throat> it's gonna train the rest of the system, earlier system will be cytotoxic T cell, the later system will be uh, a, a larger array of T cells, and that will also talk to, to B cells. It will um, train and, and then reproduce in the spleen. And then you'll end up with memory cells on both sides, B cells, memory cells on T cells. And some of those in the average person, and particularly in the youngsters, those memory cells will be productive and will be able to attack the same antigen or something quite similar very rapidly, more rapidly than B cells, more rapidly than neutralizing antibodies. That's basically the message. If you want anything more, you're gonna to have to read another three, 400 articles over the next few years. I, I don't know what else to say. So this is the simplest thing. This is a thing we've seen for the last 30, 40 years. It hasn't changed. It's just any virus. This is no different, and there are a lot more. There are a lot more uh, abbreviations, but but basically, you're going to lead to a, a virus cell that's apoptotic. Now, with with the the problem with the vaccine is that you're talking about a piece of language. You're talking about a, an, an RNA. So how are you going to? So once you kill the cell that has that in there it spreads it even further. And it has the capability of enclosing that, that RNA into a lipid membrane and then send it off wherever it decides to send it off in a communications network. So exosomes, that, how many people have used exosomes? Okay, maybe half, okay. Well, it's a communications network. It's an ability to, to talk. It's a homey, it, it has intelligence. <clears throat> it knows where to go. So in this setting, I think it goes everywhere, um, and perhaps goes <clears throat> everywhere that is the weakest point first, perhaps because it has a homing mechanism of its own. So it's, uh, once it's there, it's gonna be hard to get off. I have nothing to say on the shedding thing, um, just my own anecdotes as, which are irrelevant here. To me, the key here to show me that this is different is the thrombosis. So here we have a study on 48 million people showing that um, the excess incidence was higher and for a longer time, but also not just for the um, after hospital, more, more in the hospitalized patients than the non-hospitalized patients, but now 
uh, we have to focus on, wait a second, what about the people who are mildly symptomatic and people who'd never reach the hospital? But there are a lot of cases, and, and then some of these arterial thrombosis are sudden cardiac death. I have several patients in my practice who lost their loved one suddenly from someone who's seemingly just fine. So these are anecdotes at this point, but now you'll see that the anecdotes are flying from all over the world. And this helps explain some of the excess deaths that are, that are happening now in the younger population. This is not the 85-year-old. The 85-year-olds are dying in the hospital from a secondary infection that they can't handle the complications of. You know, from, from getting Omicron, but they can't handle the complication. So here's this, again, this, I, I, like, I like cartoons, obviously, so <laughs> uh, you're gonna see a, a number of them. They all have different um, points. Um, you're not gonna memorize them. I, I can't memorize them anymore. I guess I'm too old. But in this one, the ang 17, the angiotensin 1 and 7 is protective. The angiotensin 2 is not protective. It's just like all the other things that we know. The ACE2 receptor is protective, but once it's depleted, when you have metabolic syndrome, which is 94% of the population, it, can, it, turns, uh, it turns into angiotensin 2 and with the virus, so angiotensin 2 is the bad guy. Well, so is, I mean, angiotensin 2 is the bad guy. ACE2 receptor being lower is the bad guy. Well, this is sort of the same on the thrombotic side. So it's a constrictor. It's a coagulant. It's a procoagulant. This is to remind me that aside from lymphocytes and B cells, and now we know macrophages, NK cells, and dendritic cells, we have the explosive capability, and Dr. Nathan knows more about than I do, uh, on the complement system. So the complement system can have its own regulation and its own ability to provide for a chronicity that has been the case with chronic fatigue syndrome, with the ME, with the Lyme, and now with long COVID. It has that capability with mold, with reactivation of other viruses. We don't know how to tease it out anymore because most of the people have something else in their systems. But the complement cascade is important in, in this particular set of slides. It's important uh, to, to understand that it can also talk to the neutrophil population. It's a pro-inflammatory signaling, and it could also talk to the coagulation system. But measuring complement is more sophisticated, maybe. Dr. Nathan will talk about it in more detail. But the endothelium is the target. Why? Because it's filled with ACE2 receptors. So it's an, organ, it's an organ onto itself. And what happens when you dysregulate endothelium? You get uh, a leak because it, it, it's, a, it's a permanent barrier like the gut barrier, which is now leaky. And then you get it uh, to be dysfunctional. With dysfunctional endothelium leads to platelet aggregation. Platelets make it worse, more thrombin, more fibrin, and more clotting. So the microclots are all due to endothelial dysfunction, and it produces a vasoconstrictive state. So micro hypoxia, micro ischemia, is part and parcel of <clears throat> our long COVID patients. So it has directly effects, and and I want to say just just because it came to my mind right now that SARS CoV two has a direct um, magnetism to mitochondria. So it's there. It's on every mitochondria. And more likely than not, the spike protein after certain numbers of vaccinations or immunizations probably has the same thing in, in those patients. Whether it's one or two, I think depends on the host. So you have these great slides. The, the, you're welcome to, to look these articles up. Some of them take a long time to digest because you actually will know every single abbreviation there. <laughs> um, but the basic thing is, is that on the bottom left of the left side, you'll see that fibrinous clot with tissue factor, with thrombin factors, 
with complement cascade, with the platelets uh, that can be barely seen. They're barely seen in the top slide with a bunch of dots next to the center set of cytokines, which again, platelets are part and parcel of the activation network that basically say this endothelium is so disrupted that I'm going to plug this hole myself. I'm going to produce this fibrinous clot. I'm going to be a, a major constituent of this clot that's going to either disrupt the flow completely or at least seal the wound that's happened here. Now, part of this is happening in the brain of everybody that has brain fog, whether it's directly due to virus or it's secondarily to the gut inflammation that then produces the brain inflammation. This is probably what's going on in the folks with stroke. Now, stroke may have a large cell component, but does it have to? It doesn't have to. It can all be microvascular. I think we, we will see a subset of patients with stroke in the future that will respond faster than before. You know, there's a normal variation of how you present first with aphasia and then you slowly get better over time with, without any much intervention. But there may be a group of these micro thrombite people who will get better faster because of a collateral flow is still intact. Okay, here's some more of the, of the abbreviations, but the important thing is, is that it's listed to micro and macro vascular thrombosis in the lung. There are no, that I'm aware of, no published autopsies of people with long COVID now. Now, it's always been like 3% in the United States. You know, 3% of people get autopsies. But in this setting, I haven't seen a single published study on long COVID. Maybe if you do, please send it to me. Because it may be uh, that the families are just not doing it or the uh, academics don't want it. So, I mean, one of the two has to happen. So we're, we're already down from when I first started, um, when I did pathology in the late 70s, we had around 20%. Now it's closer to 3%. And usually, a lot of those are, um, are for legal reasons. So the other one is actually leaking. People who just walking around with long COVID, they say, I didn't hit myself at all. I mean, I, I'm just so careful now. I don't bruise, because I bruise. They have bruises all over their arms. They're just all over in places that don't usually bump into things. So that's the leak that's happening with the formal break uh, in, the, in the microcirculation. You also have inflammation going on at the same time, which is why this is persistent. And thus, unless you solve this inflammasome being uh, chaotic, you're, not going, you, you're just going to watch it. You're not going to do it. It's because the D-dimer doesn't tell you the extent of this. It's not, car I mean, yeah, I mean, I'd rather have a smaller D-dimer than a larger D-dimer, but it doesn't necessarily correlate. And by bringing down the D-dimer, are you, uh, is it a linear relationship between endothelial injury? Probably not, because when we have a normal patient with an elevated D-dimer and we give them natokinase or beloke or low molecular weight heparins, uh, it comes right down for straight relationships between the D-dimer and venous thromboembolism, for example. It comes right down. Here, it doesn't come right down. So there's, it may not be a one-to-one -one thing. So it may take longer for this to heal than the, the, the value of the laboratory itself. And why? It's because this, is, um, this has a complicated cascade. This has other disorders going on. We see from Dr. Voljani activated reactivation of HHV6 and EBV and probably CMV and others. And, and I think if we went to the Fry lab and did Fry lab stuff on every patient, we'd find some unusual organisms in some of these long COVID patients that none of us would even be able to say. I mean, organisms we've never heard of before uh, but this also involves the complement cascade that then in, in, interf 
sort of in, intersects with the, the, the other toxins in the body. So this leads to the following types of things. You can measure fibrinogen, and if you have it, it's elevated. It's usually elevated early, you're probably sicker. Uh, elevated factor eight, uh, you know, PT, PTT, uh, elevated. All these things may, may show you what you already know. This person is not doing well, and it may be something that you can follow over time if it's abnormal in the first place. This is an interesting article to pull. The, the references in the back uh, and the, the bottom, it's a Nature article. Uh, I think it's um, just recent. So never mind this. It, it's going to be repeatedly, it's going to be repeated, but uh, the, the notice on the, bottom, on the bottom left is that there comes a time when this starts to leak. The first leak that everyone knows about is the ARDS leak, because that, that makes the hyaline... Me they, that makes the fact that the lung is weighing four times what it should weigh with liquid and fluid. But this is happening throughout the body, and to me the most important one happens to be the brain because in the heart, this is not the cause, this is not what you see when you have uh, a patient with um, sudden cardiac death or a patient with myocarditis. You don't see the leak. You see the leak in the heart when you have fulminant myocarditis, which has never been described with this, with this particular virus. Yeah, so this is what the leak look, I mean, this is the representation of what the leak looks like, uh, but this is, an, this is all a, a chaotic inflammasome reaction. So the one on the bottom is what we have been dealing with since the day one on Thursday on, on ozone. What's the role of ozone in this? That Dr. Schallenberger gave his brilliant lecture or opening the, the sessions up, but he gave an equally great lecture opening the EBU sessions up. Um, EBU just being a sophisticated way of giving more and more ozone very, very, very safely. This, this is what we're dealing with. It's, it's a persistence. That's going to be proven over and over again. An abnormal immune response. The homeopaths used to call this, this is a chaotic response. They called it a syphilitic response, like syphilis, because syphilis is chaotic enough to continue, continue, continue until you die without stopping. This isn't a psychotic response. I don't mean PSY, psychotic. Psychotic being SYC, something that you can contain. This isn't a containable response. Reactivation of the infections, the toxins uh, leading to mitochondrial dysfunction. I think we've heard that uh, from Dr. Pamela Smith's thing, uh, a lecture. It, it has to have a global impact on cellular function rather than doing directly viral damage, although what we don't know is what the mechanism is using the spike protein as the vaccine injury. We just, we don't know. Now we know some of the early factors that have been published in very serious journals, immunology journals. The one on the, in the, in the middle is the one. It, I, I've showed this in the first day. It's type two diabetes, some to do to worse. They have more metabolic syndrome. They have a worsening of the ACE2 receptor to start off with a baseline. They have then a persistence in the RNA emia, so bl blood-based RNA and tissue-based RNA in the, in the form of the spike protein. And then they may have Epstein-Barr. They may have autoantibody. What is missing from this is many of my patients, certainly, in California have toxic mold in their system. So what, what is one of the most universal thing that happens when you have these other things, these co-infections? Your natural killer cell population is depleted. So then you have a, a worsening of your surveillance system and that early, that early system that produces the earliest cytotoxic T cells is lower. So that gives you the burden, that gives you the burden, the area under the curve for an extra day or two or three, and that's where the damage is initiated if you have the virus. But if you have the immunization, perhaps it's exactly the same. Because it is, the spike protein is considered foreign. It's an antigen. 
So if you don't respond to the antigen properly because your surveillance system is diverted for, for other reasons, perhaps that short delay is enough to trigger this ongoing thing. Uh, now now we're, we're, we're going into long COVID, and we're also going into vaccines. This is what's out there. So you have the, the group that I showed you before that says there are four things that predict. This is early. This is stuff that you have this decide early, and then they found that this predicts the long COVID. It doesn't have, you know, it is what it is. It doesn't mean that autoantibodies are the only thing. It doesn't, it doesn't have mold here at all. It doesn't have um, the, the specific viruses here. It just has Epstein-Barr virus. It doesn't mean it can't be another cofactor. But these were the ones that were documented, and this is going to be the type of articles that we had been hoping to be coming out of the long COVID centers. This should be already available. We, you know, this should be testable on the millions of people going to these centers, and we should have this data at this time already. This has been going on for two years. Well, you can come into this long COVID thing right away. You can come in as a post-hospital patient. You're in this recovery unit. You survived, miraculously survived. Maybe they gave you some vitamin D, maybe not. Maybe you're just like a strong like a bull. But at the same time, you, you could go into the left column. You could say, you, you just, you can enter here with the fatigue syndrome, more like with the, the, the post-Lyme thing. Or you can come here with the neurological slash thrombotic event thing. Uh, this is just a, these columns are, are made by the authors. We would probably write the columns differently. But this is three, three ways that they considered people coming into the system. And there are other, there are other articles showing the, all, all the different systems, but these are not unique to um, po long COVID. They're, they're mimicking what you see with a chronic fatigue syndrome, a bad case, and, and Lyme. But, but, but the level of neuropathy, the level of, of visual disturbance, the, the level of GI dysfunction, uh, the level of all the different neurological manifestations, in my opinion, go deeper than the other illnesses. So you have these things that uh, you already discussed, the dysbiosis and reactivation, the autoimmunity, the viral reservoir, all these things are part and parcel of long COVID. And if you don't know this uh, and you don't act on it, you won't get there. So then you say, well, what's happening in, in the autoimmune state? We heard Dr. Voljani say something that was pretty interesting. I think he said, um, you can find the virus or the virus cross-reacts, the, the antigens in that virus or in the, or in the, the vaccine cross-react with antigens that are normally found on normal tissue in every tissue of the body. Now that is probably unique to this virus. I don't think we've, we may have seen it before, but we haven't been able to study it before. So that's pretty interesting. So you can have molecular mimicry as a mechanism of autoantibody production, whether that produces a disease or not, I don't, it depends. But, um, but that the possibility is, so the more of the stuff you have, it's not just ANA and double-stranded uh, uh, DNA, it's not just that. But I want you to focus on the brain fog people that you can't immediately reverse. They look for autoantibodies to brain proteins. If you have someone who has congestive heart failure, look for antimyosin antibodies, look for cardiac antibodies. Uh, if they're commercially available. They used to be in my day, because that's, that's how we diagnosed um, that a dilated cardiomyopathy due to, or cardiac injury due to, to, due to our original viral insult. But that no matter what, um, in the brain, fog, if it's gonna re reverse right away, you're reversing it with an anti-inflammatory uh, regimen. Um, the it's not permanent, 
but in, if it is per, any any permanent injury, like a neuropathy that may be, I mean, semi-permanent, uh, you're going to have to deal with the mitochondria and the cart. You'll have to deal with the mitochondria and so on. So if you want, I think we've had a stack. I'll pull it out. What was my mitochondrial stack? Or someone else who was one of the speakers will try to pull it out this afternoon and get the expert panel to say, oh, this is what I take. This is what I should, you know, this is what you should take. We've had one for certain from Dr. Pamela Smith yesterday. And then you have the mitochondrial thing. We, we, we talked about that. Now, you... It's the ACE2 receptor. You've heard this over and over again. It's downregulated. It, it's already downregulated in the majority of people. Well, it's now downregulated more. And there, angiotensin 1 and 7 are the good guys. Angiotensin 2 is the bad guy. This is more of the vascular. Um, and that leads to the vasoconstriction, thrombosis, and the injury, and so on. You, we've seen all that before. But then on the, on the, le on the right side, wait a second, it, it actually directly invades and impacts the mitochondria. It makes it dysfunctional. It can, it can induce mitochondrial apoptosis. It can actually destroy a mitochondria. It can do that on its own, or it does it secondarily by increasing reactive oxygen species that then can kill whatever it decides to, to, to kill. And this one, it's a little, a little bit different. Um, that um, uh, the, yeah, the MAVS is interesting, and these ORFs and so on, uh, there's another slide on it. Th these are normal. These are normal uh, signaling molecules that say, oh, there's something wrong here. There's an invader here. And it's, it, it has its own mechanism of suppressing those. We've had you know, mold and other toxins can hide. <clears throat> this one doesn't hide. This one just has the machinery in place. It says, okay, you're supposed to be protective. I'm going to downregulate you. This is going to lead to a, in you to a severe inflammatory reaction. There's nothing hidden about it. So it uses these uh, receptors, and then it induces apoptosis receptors, the BCL receptors, and so on. It does so out in the open. It causes normal mitochondria to undergo fusion, it overlaps, and here's where it links up to the iron. I, I'm not the iron expert here. At the same time, I'd say that the comments by Dr. Mercola and old comments by Dr. Thompson realizes that its ability to, to interrupt that heme complex and produce oxidized iron and replace the efficiency of, the, of, of heme into the oxygen transport system that leads to a lot of different pathology and air hunger and so on is, is fundamental. But these fused mitochondria are not normal and they will undergo mitophagy. They will die. Putting back together a damaged mitochondria is something mitochondria know how to do. They do that all the time and do it every day. But once they're gone, it's a whole difference. The biogenesis of mitochondria is a whole different phenomenon. When you're looking at brain pathology, don't get an MRI. If you're looking seriously for something, use a PET scan. I mean, you can use MRI, but you, use, you need a functional met metabolic thing. Because when you do, on the red side, you, you'll see the different areas of the brain have lower metabolism than others. I think the red is normal, the blue is the affected. So you'll see every part of the brain in any given person has much less me metabolic function than the other one in people with real serious injury. You don't see that on, a, you could see edema on an MRI, but you, you don't see this metabolic dysfunction. Now, if you have access to a PET scan, these are very seriously ill people, these were studied. But encephalitis at autopsy, with people who are di dying, you find a few, you find a few, but, but when you do the studies on the bottom, it just says this is a meta-analysis of 79 studies. You don't really find a lot of encephalitis in the, in, the early, in the early autopsies. But in this study, on the bottom is this link. This study is a tour de force. It's a guy who reviewed thousands and thousands of articles around the world, took all the articles, and then linked it up to functional MRI and PET scans. And there's an enormous variability in neurological 
The second word there is more important, behavioral symptoms. Anywhere from all the way over from, I, I'm not, you know, I have memory loss, the usual things, you know, the, the brain fog, to I'm more irritable, all the way over to psychosis. Past psychosis is um, seizures. But in the behavioral realm, every and anything. Now you see that with, you can see that with Lyme, but here it's more of a, pro seems to be more of a problem and is due to edema and it's due to the overall hypofunction of certain parts of the brain more than others. So this one, you can read, there's 50 pages of, of individual cases. You have to sift through and you say, oh my God, this is, and it's related to, to the PET scan results. But then there is a subset that's auto, purely autoimmune on the bottom and they respond to steroids, they respond to plasmapheresis. And that's the interesting thing. So here, there's a, a Dr. Freed is here as a plasmapheresis person. She has these patients, you know, and she wants to be able to treat them more efficiently. You know, she's got her EBU, maybe she should use that instead. But we have in the literature plasmapheresis, a, therapeutic apheresis is another word resolving these folks and also high dose steroids of resolving those folks and their autoimmunity which is documented in testing goes away one of the autoimmune um, tests is by cyrax one of them so you have a lot of brain problems and this is enough to stop you from working even at home but again the average the average case at autopsy when you come in for you, the reason you had your autopsy is you had ARDS, very, very low incidence of encephalitis. Then you have the long-term thing, okay? Okay. You see the ground glass appearance on the upper left uh, towards the lateral, lateral wall? You see that ground glass appearance? It's not found in the, in the, in the, in the, next, sli in the next slice. Little, little uh, areas of that same appearance in the lower left. That's early. This is later. It's more, it's, it's, it's diffuse. It's not low bar, multi low bar. And then on the, on the, on the right side, it's, it's already producing some level of scar formation. You know, it's, it's very dense. It could be heme. It could also be in the reticular pattern. It's more, um, uh, likely early. It's going to lead to fibrosis. And then later, it's formally fibrosis. So there it's, on the right side is more perivascular or peribronchial. There are, there are, looks like there are holes. That's maybe areas of bronchiectasis where there's loss of normal architecture completely. And on the bottom left, right towards the apex, those tissues are gone already. That's over. That's not going to come back. Maybe make it more efficient by ozone or some kind of other measure, but that's not coming back. This is a case report we did in the New England Journal of Medicine using therapeutic apheresis. Uh, left side was the bilateral. This is a chest x-ray, the same on CT, and the right side is four months later. Completely reversible, but within six weeks. Saying it's related to therapeutic apheresis is silly, because we used ozone, we used methylene blue, we used a photo, a photo modulation, we used intelligence when it comes to mitochondrial function. You know, we used therapeutic, uh, I mean, uh, time-restricted eating. We used everything at our disposal. In that case, I said, if this was me, oh, we didn't have EBU then. So now the question is whether EBU will take over more cases and they'll be more available. It's not simple to find even a practitioner who knows how to do plasmapheresis. But, but that was available, so we used it, and it was successful enough to publish it in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this is, and when you have then linkages to research groups, because all the research groups want to publish in the New England Journal of Medicine, you entice them that way and they can measure a hundred different things and so you can find things. It's like if I'm going to look for things, I'm going to find them. In this case, it's cytokine profiles and right now we, 
now that the thing is published, we can't get them to repeat the same studies now. So we don't know. Now we know he's better, that's all. So here is the myocarditis, but it's a model for post-viral autoimmunity. Um, and ultimately, it, it produces a reaction to every cell, every myocyte in the heart. If you have autoimmune, auto, post-viral autoimmunity in the heart, and you develop, 10 to 15% of them develop dilated cardiomyopathy, sometimes years later, you have something that basically is covering the entire, the entire heart. So you have a global impact of dysregulation. It starts, but it also has an impact on mitochondrial function. So we haven't seen the full extent of the 15% patients yet. Here is what it looks like. The black is in situ hybridization for the SARS-CoV-2. Um, you notice that it's not in the cell, not in the myocytes, if you could recognize that. It's inside the endothelial cells. It's inside the interstitial fibrosis cells, inside the matrix. It's not in the heart itself. At this time, this is only one case. It, it may, in fact, be found in a few rare cases. This, how, this is what I could take this from an, an HIV uh, study that we did 25 years ago and looks identical. But from a patient with dilated cardiomyopathy. So there's other things. What's there? It's ICAM-1, it's P-selectin, it's um, an antimyosin antibodies covering the, the, the surface of the cell, mucking up the ionic transports and making the mitochondria less efficient. But early on, you don't see. Late pathology, you, it's hard to find these cases because they're selected for ARDS. They're not selected now for long COVID. So we have, to get, we have to wait for those. And this is an article I published 30 years ago with abnormal expression of mitochondrial antigens on the cell surface of the heart. So how did the antigens get there? A few cells leaked autoimmune reaction to those, inter, those cytoplasmic proteins, then it's got a global impact. So here you go. We've seen this before. We'll see it this afternoon, so I'm not going to do that. So there's a lot, lot, lot going on on the heart side. This is a serious cardiotropic virus. It's the most serious one we've ever seen. Well, we're going to have a lot of things and a lot of vascular events. How is it moving around the body with such ease? It may be moving about um, with these vis-a-vis -vis these exosomes. We don't know. But these exosomes can be found on day 14 following vaccination. And then you could follow that all the way out to, and this is a, coming from a brain uh, article, and you can follow it out. Uh, but we, the United States Senate uh, feels that this was re released from the Wuhan lab and therefore was genetically modified. It was just leaked from there. Uh, nothing sinister about that. It didn't come from the from the from the local uh, fish market. So at the same time, it has the capability that we now know. So both early and now late, we have these protein, these mitochondrial specific receptors. And the worst you, the worst cases are. This is the main slide. It's an immune saboteur in the population that is affected the most, but therefore it's the patients that can, if, they, if, you, if you can handle those complications, they could become healthier than they've ever been before because they're no longer at risk because you've taken care of all the boxes that got them there in the first place, including ourselves. You know, I had a persistent cough for maybe four weeks. You had it for longer. Uh, I said, this doesn't make sense. Uh, I know I don't have viremia anymore. And did the real-time macrotoxin test? High. So get rid of, use my ultra binder, use my binders. Uh, you know, and that's now I'm healthier in that aspect than I've been before.